forum. But I'd like to move on to our closing presentation. Uh, Professor Linus Aparo, to say some closing remarks. Over to you, Linus. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, um, colleagues. Um, first of all, I would like to thank our moderator for today, Jeff, for really um, helping us to, to manage uh, this program very, very efficiently like most agricultural engineers do. I want to start also by thanking all the people who have registered to join us today and those who also wanted to join us today, but for some other reasons were not able to join us. I want to thank all of you. Uh, this is my closing remark. I'm going to use it as an opportunity, perhaps to re-emphasize some of the important points that have been raised during this launch event, because I think it is very, very important that we continue to talk and discuss and so that we can find better ways and means to work together, to partner together, and also to help to drive the change that we want on the African continent. As I was listening to our invited um, guests and speakers, a couple of statements and words came to mind, which I think resonate with the spirit and the mission and vision of PASAI. Professor Gitao did talk about moving from subsistence to mega industries and using agriculture as an avenue for the development and industrialization of Africa. Our guests from the FAO also talked about the importance of agricultural mechanization development strategies and emphasized the need to build Africa's capacity for us to be able to achieve our goal in this area. And so on and so forth. I also like to mention also the statements that were made by our colleagues from the Afrexim Bank, that agriculture is not just about feeding Africa and the world, that our agriculture should also enable us to trade with the rest of the world. The point was also made that there's a huge deficit, and I think this is very, very important. And maybe that is another project that we in the Pan-African Society for Agriculture and Engineering have to think about the massive deficit in agricultural engineering that is required to develop and transform and modernize African agriculture was mentioned. And this is also related with the idea and the proposal to find ways and means to mainstream agricultural engineering in the agri-food systems of Africa, our countries and regions and the world at large. And so all these issues come together and they all speak to why we gather here today. Professor Adikwala did mention the importance of partnerships. And we at PASAI recognize this. And that is why you can see the nature of our program today and the organizations and individuals that we've been partnering with that we have invited. Professor Adikwala also did highlight the critical role of engineers in the modernization and transformation of African agriculture and made specific mention about the need for us to do something about the handbook. And I think as engineers, we have an important role to play to determine what exactly needs to be done about the handhold in African agriculture. At this juncture, I just want to also emphasize the critical role of organizations like Rural Forum, which I think laid the blueprint indeed for the formation of PASAI. When I first came back to the continent back in 2009, one of the first trips that I made outside South Africa was to Uganda. And one of the organizations that I visited was Rural Forum. Professor Adepola inspired me and my colleagues from the Faculty of Agri-Science at Stellenbosch University. And Professor Adepola will also remember about the conversation we had and the need for South Africa to get involved in institutions like Stellenbosch University. I was inspired indeed. And when I went back, I made sure that I brought it to hold on our institution, our university, Stellenbosch University, to become the first South African university to join the forum because I saw the need and the importance of this type of partnership if we are supposed to and if we want to make progress in transforming Africa and African agriculture. So colleagues, the question then that is important in this book, in this report launch is, agricultural engineering responding to Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. And if you look at the seven pillars of Agenda 2063, three of them come to mind. The first one is Pillar number one, a prosperous Africa. The second one is a peaceful and secure Africa, which is pillar number four. 
And the third one that I want to single out is pillar number six, an Africa whose development is people-driven, relying on the potential offered by the African people, emphasized. And so if you look at the situation in Africa, which many people have already discussed during this launch here, we know that agriculture is the fundamental, is at the base of our current economic situation on the continent. But we have an agriculture that has been characterized as backward. And of course it is backward compared with the rest of the world. We have a decent agriculture, subsistence agriculture, smallholder agriculture, resource poor agriculture. And what I ask myself and my colleagues is, why do these characterizations become the current and future, look like the future of African agriculture? What happened to the rest of the world, Asia, North America, South America, Latin America, Oceania, what did they go through and how did they go through the transformation of their agriculture? When I dug deep, dug deep into the literature, I found that uh, these characterizations also were applied to those parts of the world sometime in the past. What have they done and what did they do to move agriculture from subsistence to industrialization that, can now, that has helped their people, majority of their people to move out of poverty? If you look at the productivity of African agriculture, we know that there's an opportunity for 155% growth in our production of cereals. That potential is just lying there. For 155% growth in the production of cereals on the African continent. So productivity is very, very low. And we know the consequences of that. post harvest losses are very, very high. We lose over 48 billion US dollars per annum of food that has been produced but never make it to our dining tables on the African continent. But at the same time, we spend nearly $40 billion per annum importing food, mainly processed food from the rest of the world. There is a problem with that food system. But there is nothing wrong in trade. We heard about Africa Bank and other organizations promoting trade both within the continent and outside. What is wrong with our Africa's importation is that we sometimes even borrow to import, and we're not able to offset the cost of what we import. That's a problem there. Africa's yield of major crops is only a very small fraction of the yield compared with the rest of the world. Even in those crops that I say, these are the crops that feed Africa, maize, cassava, yam, plantain, banana, Africa's yield is sometimes about three or four times lower than the rest of the world. There is a problem there. Even in, the, even in poultry, in livestock, in the play, most parts of the continent, birds will produce about two, three kg of eggs per annum. Whereas in the other parts of the world, we're talking about 25 kg, 20 kg. These are just simple statistics to show the opportunity that lie ahead for us in Africa here. Many of us who trained as agricultural engineers we will remember the groundbreaking work of Professor Gills, the work he did for FAO back in the 1970s, that showed a near linear relationship, that showed a near linear relationship between power input in agriculture and crop yield. The story cannot be different from Africa. Why should it be different? Even current evidence of work done in other parts of the continent and in Southeast Asia still confirm this relationship. So how come that in 2021, we still have over 80% of the power in African agriculture provided by human muscle? Something is wrong with that. Something is wrong with that. With engine power, not less than five to 10%. And this is exemplified by the number of tractors as an index of power that is being used in African agriculture. So we know there are gaps and opportunities. We know that agricultural engineering can play an important role not just on the technology, but our profession, our discipline is about also about human capacity. We need people who can drive this change, both in technology development, but also implementation. A few years back, I've been, I was consulted by a few Fortune 500 companies who asked me to do some preliminary studies around the, in, within the continent of areas they wanted to invest in agriculture. And I can tell you one single factor that became very, very clear why some of these organizations did not come to invest in Africa was the capacity gap they saw, the capacity gap. If you wanted to lay a field of 
1,000, 2,000 hectares of crop, new crop production in a rural area anywhere in Nigeria, Uganda, or Kenya for that matter. Where do you have that critical mass of agricultural engineers who have the first hand experience in the type of agriculture that you want to implement to invest their millions of dollars in? Where? So something is wrong with agriculture and food systems. And at the same time, we do know that simple agricultural engineering technologies like leveling the soil and applying some irrigation can actually increase your crop yield by 60 to 70 percent. The statistics are out there, just leveling the field. Even work done on the continent, wheat production in, Ethiopia, in, in, um, in, um, in Egypt had shown this data and so on and so forth. So the evidence are out there about the role of engineering and technology. So we need to water Africa agricultural food systems. The Africa agricultural food systems is very, very thirsty. Irrigation rate is the lowest in Africa compared with the rest of the world. And we know that crop production, when irrigation is properly done, in some areas up to 90% increase in yield have been reported. We also need to embrace other modern technologies like biotechnology so that we can get the benefits and the dividends of other technologies that we're applying. We all do know the importance of high yield varieties and irrigation in the green revolution that happened in Asia. Why should Africa's story be different? Why do we want to do it the hard and wrong way? At the same time, we need to feed and rejuvenate African soil. Fertilizer rate application is the lowest. It's lowest in Africa. But at the same time, we talk about the 2006 Abuja Declaration on Fertilizer for African Health of State, which recommended that fertilizer utilization on African agriculture should be increased from eight kilograms NPK per hectare to about 50 kg NPK per hectare by 2015. All the current evidence shows that we have not come close to this goal. Now, if you put all this together, what can we do as engineers? What is our role? I believe that Africa needs a highly skilled workforce, not only highly skilled workforce, but Africa also needs new thought leaders, those who can chart a new directory, new direction for African agri-food systems. The current system has not been working, and I think if we continue for the next 50 years, it is not likely going to work. The evidences are out there. For example, we know that the value added in agricultural sector reduces as the country's GDP increases. The graph and statistics are all out there. It does not mean that agriculture is no longer important in those countries. It just means that economy has to develop, industrialize in such a way that those who are not productive in agriculture can move to other sectors. Why must every African grow what they need to eat? That is a problem with that. We also do know that the population of a community or a country involved in agriculture will naturally decline as that economy develops. Why would that story, what do we need to do? It's like we're resisting that trend as if we have another magic bullet that is different from the rest of the world. A lot of forecasters in science and technology have talked about the role of engineering. Some colleagues at Forbes, most of you know who follow all these um, forecasts in science, predicted about 10 years ago that agricultural engineering will be among the top measures by the year 2022. And I want to read out those measures. This study was mainly in the USA, but it's quite applicable to Africa and the rest of the world. Look at the measures that were predicted 10 years ago that is going to drive global growth. Mathematics, robotics. The third one was agricultural engineering. The fourth one was hospitality. Fifth was health and biotechnology. Sixth was pray law, ninth and seventh was quantum engineering, number 10 was 3D printing, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to come back to this 3D printing as I finish. So as we think about the class of agricultural engineers of 2063, what do we need to do? What type of capacity, what type of talent are we looking for to help us drive this new agriculture in Africa? The class of 2063, I call them. The role of biology, has become increasingly important. 
And it is not surprising that many departments of agricultural engineering in Africa and around the world have included some more emphasis about the biology component, biological engineering, biosystems engineering, and so on and so forth. I don't think those changes were just fancy. They were not window dressing. Those who reflect the importance of the biological part of engineering that we practice, unlike other engineers. It's an opportunity for us to develop new talent, new skills, who have better understanding of the relationship between that biology and engineering, so that we can actually make Africa's agriculture take that quantum limb, just like we have done in ICT. We can do it in agriculture if we can embrace this modern bio revolutions in agriculture. Our governments are beginning to realize this, but often the talk does not match with the action on the ground. If you go online at the moment, the news is abuzz with the vice president of Nigeria talking about mechanization, talking about post service losses. And I think Professor Silsibanjo it was actually talking to agricultural engineers. It's the time for us to embrace those opportunities and challenges and create the type of agriculture and Africa that we want. So we call on our partners to please stick with us in this journey. We need each other. And we're very, very happy that you are with us. This journey has just begun. We need to maybe think about those institutional arrangements that will enable us to cement and solidify and consolidate these partnerships and relationships as we tackle these challenges ahead of us here. So I extend our warm welcome and invitation to each of you to please stick along with PASAI as we move forward in addressing some of these specific challenges here. As we close today, I just want to mention very specifically a very dear colleague and friend of mine and of our association, Professor Nobu Banada. Sometime late June, Professor Banada contacted me. We chatted almost every day, telling me that his health was not good. He asked me, please pray for me, my brother. And I prayed for him. And I sent messages around asking my friends to also pray, pray for Nobu. Unfortunately, on my birthday, I just got back and a message came to me from Uganda telling me that Nobu has just succumbed to COVID-19. I was shattered. Nobu was a rising star. Nobu has just begun his journey about helping us and making his contribution to the transformation of African agriculture and the great the continent that we want. Many of you will remember Nobu as a very, very enthusiastic, bright, smart, courageous young man. Nobu has been awarded some of the highest prizes any young man would have dreamt of. He was received by the Pope, and we're all very, very glad when that happened, and so on and so forth. It is very, very interesting also to know that Nobu was also at the forefront of fighting, fighting COVID in Uganda, and of course, on the African continent. If you go online, you will see that Nobu used 3D printing, which was predicted 10 years ago as one of the major drivers of future technology and economic development around the world. Nobu was already applying 3D printing last year to develop face masks for people to utilize in Uganda. Very, very sad that we lost Nobu, but we're very, very proud of him. We're very, very proud of Makarere University. We're very, very proud of Uganda. And on behalf of PASAI and the Agricultural Engineering Fraternity, we want to thank the family of Nobu for making him available for us for the short time that we have worked with him. We continue to be indebted, and I'm very, very pleased to also re-emphasize that this PASAI report is dedicated to the memory and to the work of Noble Banada. Friends and colleagues, at this juncture, I want to also thank you once again for being part of the journey of PASAI. This journey has just begun, and I welcome you on board and we look forward to the opportunity of collaborating with you as we move forward. Thank you very much for the day. Thank you, our launcher. Thank you, our guests. And thank you, all the participants. Thank you very much.